lovely conference. And Brilliant. Enjoy the keynote. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining Code Garden 2022. You are for a treat. Enjoy. And without further ado, please allow me to present the keynote speakers, Kim, Philip, and Emma. Let's give them a round give of applause. Give them a warm welcome. Come on. Beautiful people. Also you, Callum. Welcome to Code Garden 2022. We have been looking forward to this. You stole my line. This is awesome. Like, I'm so excited to finally be here again and to see all of your faces. And I can't wait to talk to all of you later today. Yeah, we are super excited to have you here in person and online. And we want to welcome you to what will essentially be, in all modesty, the most brilliant, wonderful, engaging, and exciting Code Garden to date. Another person who have been waiting for us to be back in Odense is the mayor of Odense. And to kick us off, please welcome the mayor, Peter rabeck -Juhl. Thank you. I can see I picked the, the right jacket to the picture. So. <laughs> I got uh, a light jacket and a dark jacket, so it's a light jacket day today. <laughs> Dear developers, project managers, business owners, and Umbrakio geniuses, what an absolute pleasure it is to welcome you all to Odense for Code Garden 2022. We have had a rough couple of years when uh, COVID uh, came in and completely turned society on its head. It meant that uh, last year's Code Garden had to go virtual. And although I have heard that it was a success, I still think that most of us are happy that we once again can meet face to face. I think we learned a lot from COVID. Personally, I realized how much it means to be a part of a strong community, to speak with different kinds of people and gain new perspectives. And in many ways, that's, that's really the essence of Code Garden gathering hundreds of very different people from different countries, sectors, and companies, but all connected by a common passion for Umbraco and for its, and of all its uh, functionalities. To me, much of it, I have to be honest, is uh, somewhat gibberish. I took, a, I took a glance through the program for the rest of the day and stumbled upon a session called the role of the CMS in the modern composable DXP. <laughs> now I don't have the slightest clue of what it means, but, uh, but most of you guys do, I hope. <clears throat> I really hope. <laughs> and by having all of you here in Odense, Umbraco and Code Garden contributes, contributes to creating a strong sense of community where knowledge can flow between people. That is powerful. And it sends a clear message to the rest of the world that we also have strong tech communities outside Silicon Valley. And as a mayor of Odense, I'm thrilled to welcome you all here today to our city. Here in Odense, we do prize ourselves on being a tech city. We are among the very best in the world when it comes to collaborative robots a neat subclass of robots designed to work closely together with people. I would like to, I would encourage you all to see the city while, you have, while you're here, because in my humble opinion, we have, a thons, thons, we, have thon, we have many things to offer. With that, I will wrap it up. <clears throat> welcome to Odense and welcome to Code Garden. I hope you will have an amazing conference with a lot of new knowledge and relations. So at the end, Super tuck or super thank you. <laughs> now I have a hoodie too. <laughs> See you around. Thank you, Peter. And I'm glad that I'm not the only one not knowing what that session is about. Before diving into this day's, uh, today's 
keynote talking about product and community, we want to start by honoring the most valuable people, the MVPs. Always start with people. It's an incredibly exciting part of the keynote for me. It's a place very close to my heart. We believe that our MVPs, our most valuable people, represent the best and the brightest of our Umbraco community, but also the friendliest. And we want to celebrate your achievements and your contribution, and this is where we do just that. So we get the great honor of announcing our brand new MVPs. Now, before we do that, we asked the community why we loved you, why we wanted to celebrate you. So if you look at the slides as we say the names, there's lots of lovely details. These are not our words, they're your words. So we could wax lyrical about how wonderful everyone is, but we'd ask you to uh, check out what your fellow community members have said. So let's see if I know how to use clicker. Our first is Corney Hoskum. Please come and collect your award. <laughs> High five, Courtney. Well done. Thank you. Please stay. Okay. Our next brand new MVP 2022 is Jason Elkin. Our third of our brand new MVPs. It's Jesper Matthewson. <laughs> Awkward hug. Thanks, Jesper. Okay, and the fourth. We don't have her here today, but it's my friend Yoka. So a big high five, you rock for Yoka, who can't be here. We should imagine she's here. We have a statue for you, Yoka. We've got Matthew Hart. Right down the back. Let's go with the next one. <laughs> we have Nurak Kaya, please. First coat garden. And then this guy, I think I've seen him before, Shannon Dominic. Okay, we have some wonderful renewed MVPs going really fast, too fast for us to read right now. But we wanted to say a huge thank you to Alex Skripnik this year, who can't be with us because of the situation in the Ukraine. We cannot wel wait to welcome him in 2023 with a massive high five you rock, potentially hugs, depending on the pandemic situation. And we just wanted to do a big round of applause for Alex before we, because he can't be here with us today. All renewed MVPs, please come to the stage. Please come to the front. If you are a renewed MVP, we want you on stage today. If you don't know who you are, well, you should, because we've celebrated. And a massive round of applause for everyone here. They may come back over what it is. High five. Oh, I can't shout. I mustn't shout. High five. MVP. MVP, Callum. MVP, MVP. MVPs, MVPs. So this will take a while, but really, they all deserve their time on stage. So come, please come. <laughs> and a huge number of people here is a testament to the strength of this incredible community. And one of the things that Kim was going to say, I believe they all have PhDs. Yeah, all of these beautiful people and Callum has minimum one PhD in friendliness. So to the rest of you, don't be a stranger. Hit them up with any questions uh, around Umbrago. They are 
PhD in uh, sharing uh, knowledge. So um, give them a high five and uh, talk to them. Thank you, Thank beautiful you people much. and Callum. So, to talk about product, please welcome Philip on stage. Take us through news on product. Thank you. <laughs> I'll uh, let, speak a little bit to let the mic guy get the sound ready. <clears throat> I am super happy to be here with you again, as I said. Uh, I've been looking forward to this day for so long. And uh, it's, it's incredible to finally be here with all of you uh, to tell you about everything that's happening at Umbraco, everything that, every, all the achievements that we've made and all the plans that we have. And uh, I intend to share uh, a lot of you, a lot with you today. Uh, so brace yourself, uh, tighten your seat back. Uh, it'll be a little bit uh, quick because we have a lot of stuff to go through. Um, <clears throat> I was thinking the other day, what is it that makes Umbraco special? Um, and I reflected over this a little bit, and I think that the special thing about Umbraco is this magic between technology on the one hand and people on the other hand, and then you can kind of think of Umbraco as that high five between the two, just that when they intersect, that's what makes Umbraco special. In my uh, previous years, I used to work in, in agency land like a lot of you do, um, so I, I, I went to conferences like this for, for some of our competitors, and I can truly say that the Code Garden conference is just, is just something special. The people are, are much more friendly, the community is much more open, and, and you know, of course the tech is a lot better. Uh, but you know, this, uh, this combination between the two, that's the secret of Umbraco, that's the secret sauce, and that's what we'll keep focusing on. So, before we dive into product, uh, I thought I would uh, just mention our new uh, 2027 vision, uh, to, so you can kind of see the bigger picture, the, the five-year uh, vision from Braco, and see how what we're doing today, what I'll be talking about, the plans for the next couple of years, how that fits into that. Um, so let, let me take you through it. I promise these are the only slides that has lots of words on them. Uh, the rest of them will be uh, kind of nice and, uh, and, and, and not, too, uh, not too wall of texty. Um, there's four parts to this. The first one is that Umbraco Cloud, including a strong headless offering, is the preferred CMS for partners and mid-market to lower enterprise customers by continuing to be number one in editing experience and the most loved CMS by developers. The second one is that we enable customers and partners to compose their preferred tech stack by simplifying integrations. This is where the composable DXP comes in. Uh, and I'm happy to take a chat with you, uh, Maya, and tell you all about that. Um, uh, but let's maybe do that in the break. Then the third part is that we continue developing and innovating Umbraco CMS together with a growing and thriving Umbraco community, ensuring the true outside-in perspective, resulting in us having more than 2 million websites running on Umbraco. And the fourth one is that the Umbraco organization has global coverage with national or regional offices covering our key markets. So that's the, that's the, the, the new vision that we put forth uh, a couple of months ago on the blog. You might have seen it before. But let me, let me tell you a little bit about what that, that, what that means to our product. Because we are a product-focused company. Uh, what does this mean? This means that uh, we think about product as the way we drive the, the, the company forward. So the, probably the number one question I get from many of you and from your uh, bosses and uh, competitors around the world is how is it that you balance this open source with the commercial part? And I like to say we don't. It's not a math thing where anytime we add someone to the cloud team, we also add someone to the core team or anything like that. That's not the point. And if you know this image, you can see that this is a, the, the, the vision or the, the image that, that I usually use is uh, of a symbiosis, where two things live super close to each other and both benefit from the other. So we have countless examples of features uh, starting in, uh, in the cloud, going down into the, to the CMS and benefiting all of us, and vice versa, 
where anytime uh, some of you uh, do a PR to the CMS, it makes all of our products better. So this is a great uh, symbiosis between the two, and I think that's a lot of the, the, the secret of, of, of our success for our products. We've been saying this for a while that open source is about uh, transparency. Open source is not about democracy. It's not like you can overturn Umbraco if you have uh, more than 50% of the votes on something. Uh, but we want to be completely transparent about what we're doing. One of our values is openness, and, and, and that speaks to the same point, that we want to share as much information as we can uh, about what we're doing, why we're doing it, how we want to do it, and what the long-term plans are. So that, that's, that's what you'll be hearing today in the keynote and in, during a lot of the talks. Uh, but the other part of that, to be truly uh, product-focused, is that we also listen. And we've, we've, we've been trying to do this a lot more uh, proactively and a lot more structured in the last uh, year or so, and we'll continue that evolution and do even more of that. We want to listen to you if you're a developer, if you're an agency owner, uh, if you're an end user, if you're an editor, uh, if you're a partner. Uh, and let me say developers again. Of course, developers are super important to us because you are the, you're the, you're the one that actually, uh, that actually builds on top of our platform. So we want to do this a lot more intentionally. Uh, earlier this year, uh, I started uh, inviting myself uh, to, uh, to meet with some of you out uh, in the real life when that was, uh, became a possibility again. So I went to see some of our partners. I went to uh, a lot of meetups, some of them virtual and some of them actually in person. Uh, and I had a lot of uh, fun and I learned a lot of stuff uh, from talking to you. So thank you to everybody who, uh, who accepted my invitation. And if you feel like uh, you didn't get it, get the invitation, then uh, please come talk to me and I'll be happy to uh, meet with your team, meet with your meetup or, or whatever. It is super important for us that we continue to listen. That is the secret of how we do the, the outside in perspective that, that, that we talked about in the vision. We've been, we've been doing this as well with adding uh, product owners to the team uh, so that the, the team has a, a person responsible for this that uh, interacts with you. I know a lot of you have talked with Lasse and Sarah already. Those are the two first POs that we hired. Uh, and if you haven't, uh, they'll be in the cloud and the CMS corner respectively uh, all through the conference. So please go and talk to them. That's probably the, the best way to inform our roadmap uh, today. We started working uh, more intentionally with, with stakeholders uh, internally uh, at HQ. Of course, whenever we build something, we need to make sure that it works in the cloud, or if, if it's in the cloud, we need to make sure that it works well with the CMS. Um, we need to make sure that uh, the, the questions that the, our support department gets the most, uh, that there is a good answer to that, or that the docs are updated, or that the feature is fixed. Um, and uh, so we started working a lot more uh, structured with this uh, for all of our products. Uh, but we recently also started doing this externally. So if you've been following along on the blog, uh, you might have seen that a couple of uh, weeks ago, we started a new CMS community team. Uh, and that's not a community team like we used to do where it's uh, contributing code and doing architecture and stuff together. But this is more of an advisory team, a team where we'll put out our roadmap, or we'll put out our plans and get you feedback before we actually finalize them. Uh, so for those of you who are in that team, uh, thank you so much for applying. Uh, and for those of you uh, who think I would love to be part of something like that, uh, watch out for the blog. We will uh, be opening similar teams for hardcore and for cloud uh, in, the, in the next round, and probably even more after that. Um, we've changed the organization a little bit uh, inside of D-Team. So now we have uh, these five areas um, with these beautiful uh, five uh, people. And uh, together, the six of us, we set the direction for uh, our products and uh, what we want to do with them. And that, of course, uh, begs the difference or begs the question, what direction is this? And we've been, we've been trying to map uh, what does the competitive landscape look like uh, for us. Uh, and today, we, we feel like uh, we're, in this, uh, we're in this quadrant down here. So our offering is uh, broad to some extent. Uh, and we're, we're typically in that uh, lower mid-market or mid-market segment. Uh, and, and what that vision that I shared uh, earlier, what that will do to us is to take us up into that space uh, for the DXP and CMS area. We want to uh, broaden the offering. Uh, I'll come back to talking a little bit more about that uh, uh, later with uh, integration and partnerships. And then on the other hand, uh, we want to take our hardcore offering that is, of course, a little bit narrower 
uh, and focus on the, narrow, the narrowing and then take it off market as well. So this means that you'll see Umbraco uh, start to cater a little bit more for the, for the lower enterprise market or for the upper market of where we are today. But I want to make sure that everybody is, can rest assured that this does not mean that we leave people behind. You can still use Umbraco and Umbraco will still be a great fit for your uh, medium or small website and will continue to be that as well. But with that, that was the, the overall introduction. So uh, let me take you through uh, some of our products, uh, what we've been up to, uh, and what we intend to do. And I'll start with Umbraco Cloud. Cloud is still uh, a great way to speed up your time to market. It's a way for you to spend your time on features instead of on infrastructures and pipelines and all, this, and all that stuff. Uh, and it's a way for you to make sure that you stay safe, stay up to date, get new features as they roll in, super, super easy. Our vision for Umbraco uh, for cloud is that we want to be the best place to host Umbraco. We want it to be a no-brainer for all of you to always choose cloud for all of your products. For cloud, uh, just since the last Code and Garden, we've shipped a lot of features. Um, and I'm not, gonna, uh, I'm not gonna go into all of these, uh, but at least I wanted to make sure uh, to mention a feature that we, don't, that we haven't talked enough about. And that's the CDN feature. Uh, as many of you know, we partnered with Cloudflare uh, a couple of years ago, and Cloudflare has been delivering uh, DNS and uh, TLS encryption uh, for your HTTP certificates. But we've actually uh, expanded the partnership to also uh, do CDN. So that means that on all the cloud plans today, uh, even on the small cheap plans, there's a built-in CDN connection, uh, or there's a built-in CDN uh, from Cloudflare in front, which can take a lot of load uh, even on the smaller sites. Uh, so this is a really, really great feature. Of course, you should probably enable it uh, at least on your static assets and media and stuff like that, but you can actually enable it on more and you can control a lot of settings from the cloud portal. I think this is a pretty great feature and probably one we haven't spoken enough about, so that's why I thought I would bring it up. We've, uh, we've updated our cloud plans. So uh, this is the cloud, uh, the plans as you may know them. Uh, and uh, about a month ago or something like that, we changed them because uh, we didn't really uh, think the, the limits were right for content nodes, for page views, and for custom domains. Uh, and that means that uh, from now on, there's no more limitations for content nodes and page views, and we've upped the number of custom domains included, and that's all for the same buck uh, that you pay today. What's next for cloud? Um, so inter in internally at the team, and you'll hear uh, Christian talk more about this later, we talk about developer experience and agency experience. And you can kind of think of that again as the technology on one hand and the people on the other hand. Uh, we've structured our teams around that, uh, and that's also the kind of features that we'll be building. We want to make sure that the, the portal is super great uh, for you as an agency owner. It should be easy to manage all your um, developers and accounts and all that stuff. Um, but we also, of course, need uh, cloud to be super great for you as a developer. It needs to be easy to pull down your source code and work on it locally and push it up, push it off uh, back into the cloud. You need to uh, integrate with the tools that you're already using. Uh, and uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll have a, a couple of, uh, of, of, of examples of stuff like this. First up is uh, two-factor authentication from Braco ID. This is a request that we've heard a lot, especially from that uh, upper enterprise uh, market where second factor or two-factor authentication is super, super important and typically uh, like a critical thing that you need to check off in some Excel spreadsheet somewhere. Uh, and that's now coming uh, uh, very shortly uh, to, um, to Umbraco Cloud. Um, then we're bringing you uh, scheduled and API-driven content transfers so that when you uh, are doing bigger changes and you want to push them from, from one environment to the next, uh, you can either uh, schedule that with a specific point in time uh, or you, you'll be able to actually control it from an API uh, so that you can you know, build it into your own pipeline or whatever you want to do so you can do it just when you think it's the right time. Then we'll be uh, adding uh, secret management as well to the cloud, so you can uh, have your API keys and all your secrets stored uh, just inside of the cloud portal, and you can easily interact with them from your own code. And then a big one that I've been uh, waiting for for a while uh, is a US region for cloud. We think this is, uh, this is super important for us. We know that a lot of you have uh, projects where there's, there's a lot of users in the US, maybe your customers in the US or the, or the, the uh, the company that you're building for lives in the US, and of course, a US region is, is super important for us. 
This means that uh, all your, uh, all the, that the, the web server or the server that serves you on Braco side can be super close to the, to the end user, which of course means uh, speed and faster, uh, but it also means that you can have all your data in the US. So if you have uh, concerns about uh, EU regulations or GDPR stuff and all that stuff, you can put it all in a, in a US-based region and all your project data will be only there. So a US data center will be coming this summer. Uh, and I want you, uh, if you're interested in this, to go sign up for our early access queue. We'll be letting people in a little bit at a time uh, to give ourselves kind of a soft launch on this. Um, so go to umbraco.com slash US data center, sign up, uh, you'll, get a, you'll get a newsletter so you know what's, what's happening, and then we'll let people in a little bit at a time. After that, we'll start to look at uh, more regions to come. Uh, and uh, please uh, help us make a decision on... <laughs> I'm not done yet. <laughs> please make a, help us make a decision on um, what, uh, what region should be next. Uh, where is it that your customers are asking for a region uh, in for cloud? Another thing that, uh, that I've been wanting uh, for quite some time uh, is the way, uh, for, for, a for a real way, to go dedicated. Sometimes you just want that uh, web app for yourself. You want all the compute uh, with uh, no other um, uh, people influencing it or, or you slowing other sites down. We want this uh, to be available to you. Uh, so we'll be bringing uh, dedicated options to cloud all the way from the starter plan to the standard plan to the pro plans. So you'll be able to choose a dedicated option uh, and get all of this uh, for very reasonable prices. You'll be able to select this in the portal yourself, uh, and this, that's coming this summer as well. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Lots of other stuff is happening on the cloud. Watch out for a dedicated cloud roadmap uh, later this summer where there's a lot of new features as well being added. And please help us inform this roadmap. This is, your, this is a very good chance to go talk to CERN or Cake uh, about uh, what you think we need to put in cloud because now is a good time to, uh, to get stuff into the roadmap. Yeah, go see uh, Cake's talk in a little bit. Go meet him and the cloud team uh, in the cloud corner and then Let's talk about hardcore. So <laughs> hardcore is, uh, is our uh, headless offering. That's what a lot of people have, have been telling you. Uh, and of course, that's true. But I want to tell you that hardcore is so much more than just APIs on Umbraco. The secret of, of hardcore is really uh, the collaboration, again, with Cloudflare, which means that whenever you uh, actually uh, work on your data in hardcore and, and you press publish, uh, all the data is sent to a different server somewhere, which means that at runtime there's no connection to your actual Umbraco instance. That means that your website will scale along with Cloudflare. So there is a lot better scaling in hardcore. Um, all your APIs are served directly from the edge uh, and cached very cleverly, uh, which means that the performance of hardcore is just uh, fantastic. Uh, and I promise you, um, and we'll continue to expand on this uh, and make performance even better. Uh, and you should absolutely go see uh, Morten's talk about that in a little bit, where he'll dive a little bit more into that. Uh, for hardcore as well, uh, we've shipped a lot of features uh, in the last uh, year or so. Uh, and I wanted to uh, especially bring up uh, the, the data property editor uh, that you see up here in the right corner. Uh, that's actually a feature that we uh, stole with permission uh, from uh, contentment, and I wanted to just give a, a quick shout out to Lee and say thank you for your great work. We're so grateful to, to be able to put this in hardcore. Um, so yeah, so give him a round of applause, please. <laughs> we also have a pretty great roadmap plan for hardcore. Um, the first feature that we'll be building, or that we're actually almost ready with, uh, is custom grid editors. Uh, as you know, uh, you can customize the, the editing experience uh, of, the, of the grid in Umbraco, but in Hardcore, we're still uh, keeping a lockdown on, on any kind of, uh, of custom code. Uh, but we want to bring you uh, that uh, slowly over the next couple of months. Uh, so for custom grid editors, this is a feature that's, that's pretty close, so that's why I can actually show you a screenshot here. Uh, you'll be able to uh, write your code right inside back office. Uh, you write JavaScript. Uh, and uh, we've actually, uh, or Rasmus, uh, has actually uh, built a, a super clever bridge 
between the current Angular JS API and something that's very close to the new back office API that I'll talk a little bit about later. Uh, but that means that if you build a, a grid editor uh, for hardcore, uh, it will be able to, uh, to seamlessly upgrade even when the back office is replaced. So this is a new way to kind of dip your toes in the new back office kind of land uh, and, uh, and have uh, custom grid editors uh, in Umbraco hardcore very shortly. That, of course, leads us to custom property editors, which is the, the next thing uh, for the team after the grid. Uh, we want to bring you that uh, flexibility of Umbraco and the Umbraco uh, back office uh, of custom property editors uh, to hardcore as well. And I can't wait for this personally. I think this, this will be a killer feature in hardcore. We will bring you uh, secured webhooks. We have webhooks already, but sometimes you need them to be authenticated, of course. We're doing uh, Sapia for forms so that you can have uh, you know, the point and click ease of Sapia uh, for form submissions uh, directly from Hardcore. This is not only a Hardcore feature, this will be available uh, for forms anywhere. Uh, and then we're building uh, the version three of our REST API. Um, this will be built on top of the open API standard. Uh, and that's great for two reasons. The first one I'll tell you now, the second one I'll tell you in a little bit. So the first one is uh, that, we're, that, that will enable us uh, to build to more effectively, more quickly build uh, client libraries uh, for more clients. So today, for Hardcore, we have client libraries for, for Node.js uh, and for .NET, uh, but we want to be able to bring you client libraries for iOS or Android or, or much more, much, much many, many more clients uh, out there, uh, and the open API-based uh, API will, give, will allow us to do that uh, a lot more efficiently. Then, uh, we will uh, have GraphQL persistent queries. So if you're a GraphQL uh, nerd out there, you'll know what this means. And this is a pretty big feature, and uh, I'm pretty excited about it. Uh, but speaking of GraphQL, we know that GraphQL is probably the killer feature of, uh, of, uh, of Hardcore today. Uh, and that's why we'll be bringing GraphQL to all the plans of Hardcore, including the small and cheap one. That happens today, which means that uh, if your project is on the, the mini plan of uh, Hardcore, you'll be able to use GraphQL right now. Go see uh, Morten's talk about that, uh, I think two talks from now or three talks from now on this very stage. Um, and go talk to Morten and Rasmus and the rest of the team. They'll be in the cloud corner as well during the days. Uh, and they have lots of, uh, of, of, of cool demos. If you ask Rasmus very nicely, maybe you can get to, uh, to see the, the grid editor in action. That brings us to Umbraco Forms. Forms is still a very, very popular product uh, uh, with a lot of you. Uh, and for good reasons, it's a pretty great product. It has a lot of uh, great features. And we've been adding uh, some cool things to Forms recently as well. Forms is now a lot more easy to organize. Uh, we can have uh, folders uh, for your forms, and you can actually do permissions for those folders. So you can say people from this department should only be, be able to work with forms in this folder or whatever. Um, and we've been, we've been making it uh, possible for you to edit those uh, customer entries afterwards. So if you want to add something or correct something, you can do that right from the back office as well. We've been uh, working on localizing the editing experience as well, just like you know from back office. So uh, uh, we now have uh, localized forms for seven languages. And if uh, you want your language to be on here and it's not, uh, then please go talk to Andy. Um, I'm sure he would love to add even more languages to, uh, to forms. What's next for forms? We'll be uh, adding uh, more improvements around workflows. So you can do more conditional workflows and stuff like that. Uh, we'll be adding uh, multi-step forms. And we're building a content app uh, where you can actually preview your form uh, before you uh, publish it. So you don't no longer have to uh, make a new page and add the form and do all of that to get a preview of what you're working on. You can see it right from a content app within BackOffice. Forms is still only 249 US dollars, and it's still free in cloud, and it's another great use case for, for using cloud. Go meet Andy and the team in the CMS corner. Um, and that brings me to Umbraco CMS. If you've been uh, living under a rock for the last year, this might be a surprise, but Umbraco now runs on .NET 5. Uh, and with Umbraco 9, like we saw so much community engagement from you, so much excitement about this. Uh, we've been looking at trends, 
Uh, and we're really happy to see that the trend we were hoping for looks like it'll, it's, it's, it's what, what's actually happening. So Umbraco 7 is uh, flatlining and kind of going down a little bit. Uh, Umbraco 8 is still doing really well, and we're seeing uh, Umbraco 9 take off. So we're really happy about this, and I can't wait to show you this next year and hopefully see the graphs, uh, those lines expanded more and all their, in the, the directions that they have. We have uh, shipped 13 releases for V9 uh, since we shipped V9 uh, back in the fall last year. Uh, with lots of great stuff in it. Uh, one of the features that I want to point out today as well uh, is the item tracking feature where, you, where we'll be able to uh, uh, inform you when you try to uh, delete media that's used on a page or delete some, some page that's uh, referred to on a different page or anything like that. We now uh, store all those relations and we'll be able to warn you and that also makes it a lot easier for us in cloud to be able to, uh, to uh, move the right stuff around. A big shout out again to Dave. Uh, the, a lot of this work was done by him uh, in his Nexu package and, and with the PRs to the court. So uh, give it up for Dave as well. <laughs> We've been working uh, the last year, year and a half, uh, on trying to be more predictable in the CMS team. We want you to have fewer surprises with the CMS, where all of a sudden there's a, there's a new release that you didn't know about. Uh, and we've been uh, talking about this as a release cadence. So that means that there's a fixed cadence, which means every six weeks, there's a new version of Umbraco. So every six weeks, there's a new minor version. And then every six months, we, take the, we, we, take, we make the difference, and then that means we'll have a new major version every six months of Umbraco. This is pretty important because that means that no longer will we have three, four years between major versions and they'll be super hard to upgrade to because there's so many breaking changes. Instead, they'll be a lot more frequent, which means that the upgrades will be a lot easier and everybody can hopefully get to the newest version all the time. We think this is really great. Uh, and of course, that brings us to the next version of Umbraco, Umbraco 10. Umbraco 10 will uh, ship with support for normal reference types. Uh, to a lot of you uh, that are developers out there, this is a really cool feature. Uh, it lets tooling help you a lot more uh, when you're working with, with Umbraco. Uh, and this has been a best practice for Microsoft for, 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 for quite some time. And we're happy to finally be able to, to support this. Uh, and when Bjarke shows you numbers later today about uh, how much has changed, I think uh, the Nullable Reference Types is probably uh, responsible for uh, almost all of the files changed uh, from between 9 and 10. So don't worry, even if you see a higher number. Uh, this, is, uh, this is just making your life easier. Then we've been adding uh, SQLite. We've been looking for a cross-platform embedded database uh, for you to work on uh, in development or uh, for really, really small sites. Uh, and you should go see Paul's talk about this. That's totally a deep dive where he goes into a lot of uh, nerdy details about uh, SQLite and what we needed to change to make this work. This is pretty great. This means that uh, for those of you who are, who are, who are using Macs, or, or Linux machines, uh, Umbraco has gotten uh, so much easier to work with, you don't need any kind of virtualization anymore. Umbraco 10 uh, works with .NET 6, which means uh, C Sharp 10, of course, and that's a pretty uh, cool thing. And then we've updated a lot of the dependencies that Umbraco has, uh, specifically these and, and a few more. Uh, but I want to just mention that the, the, the switch to Image Sharp 2 uh, means that uh, now uh, WebP is supported uh, in Umbraco out of the box, uh, which will make all of your Lighthouse scores uh, very happy and your uh, marketing people uh, look better at Umbraco. So we're really happy about that. Umbraco 10 has been in uh, release candidate uh, since May 4th, so uh, a little over a month. Uh, and it's been pretty cool to see uh, the reception from the community. Uh, all of these tweets were taken, I think, within the first 24 hours after the, after the release, and people are just talking about how easy it was uh, to upgrade their package, to upgrade their site, uh, and how smooth it is to work with uh, on different platforms. So we're, we're really, really exci excited about uh, all your feedback, and thank you so much for giving us feedback. A lot of the issues, if you've been following along, a lot of the issues that were tackled uh, on release candidate 4 and 5 uh, were, were uh, very, very minor. So we think that uh, V10 by launch, it will be super, super, super stable. The upgrade is uh, super easy. Uh, you target the .NET 6 in your project, uh, you run a command in the command line. 
you uh, add two lines of code to your uh, program file, and then you delete a couple of folders or run .NET clean, and that should be the upgrade for almost all projects. So this is pretty cool. We've, we've made a dedicated uh, documentation site that explains exactly how to upgrade. Uh, and please, uh, if you have problems with your upgrade, go talk to Bjarke and see if, you can, uh, if he can help you out. And of course, we're making that even easier in cloud. Uh, in the next couple of months, we'll be working with the cloud team to figure out how can we automate even more of this. Uh, it's, it will be a lot easier in cloud. We want cloud to be the best place to host Umbraco. Umbraco 10 is available tomorrow by accident. <laughs> <laughs> And the reason why I say by accident is I've been trying to tell everybody on the team, everybody in the community and on the board and everywhere that we no longer, we no longer ship uh, releases or we're no longer a conference-driven development company. Uh, we want to stick to our release cadence. And then by coincidence, the release cadence says that the release should go out tomorrow. So uh, I'm a little bit bummed out by that, uh, but I mean, uh, it's great. I'm happy to, uh, to be able to do a, 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 an on-stage announcement, but don't expect that next year. Maybe next year I'll say it was released a week ago or two weeks from now, and that's all according to plan. From tomorrow, you'll be able to choose Umbraco 10 uh, in cloud and have new sites spun up automatically. Of course, they'll be on .NET 6 and with all the bells and whistles. You should go see Bjarke's talk to learn a lot more about uh, what made 10 10 and what's coming after 10, what will be 11, 13, or 12, 13. We have plans for all of those. And, uh, and go see his talk to, uh, to get a lot more details on that. One other thing I wanted to, uh, to bring today from Braco 10 is official Unix support. We've had a lot of, uh, especially bigger clients, tell us that they couldn't use Braco because uh, even though we worked on Unix, we weren't supported on Unix. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that that's now uh, no longer a thing. We've, been, uh, we've had a lot of great experiences from uh, running Umbraco 9 uh, on Unix. We now have uh, people from the dev team uh, working on all platforms. So there's developers on Mac, developers on Unix or Linux, uh, developers on Windows. Um, and now with, the, with, with SQLite, with a cross-platform embedded database, we're ready to say that Umbraco 10 is now officially Unix supported. So, what's next for Umbraco? Uh, for Umbraco CMS, uh, I have a lot of features that I want to just mention just a little bit to tease you. Uh, and of course, you should go, as I said, uh, go see Biagas talk to get more details on a lot of those. We want to bring uh, permissions for variants so that you can have editors that can only uh, edit a specific language or a specific variant. Um, we want to work on a block-based version of the grid. Uh, we want to uh, do that now. Uh, and that means that we've actually put out an RFC or like a mini RFC. We, we do it with a GitHub discussion where uh, Nils and the team has been uh, defining what the grid should look like, um, how it should work, what the data model is and all that stuff. And go read that today or, or tomorrow or soon or talk to them uh, because uh, now should change to actually influence what this grid will be uh, and how it will work. Our intention is that this grid will replace the, the old grid uh, because it's, uh, it's essentially what, you, what most of you are doing anyway. It's the grid plus uh, duct type grid editor. That's basically what we want to build here. Um, the next feature I want to talk about is block level variation. We know that uh, a lot of you have uh, sites with multiple languages on them, and we, wanna, we want you to be able to vary just one uh, block inside of a grid or inside of the block list and say this one should be variant, the other one should be invariant. We'll also uh, be looking at an official way to do content reuse. A lot of you uh, are doing that today in kind of hacky ways, and you have all your own ways of doing this. And we want to bring an official way uh, uh, to Umbraco for, for working with reuse of content. All of these are features uh, that you know, has been asked for a lot, especially for bigger sites, for sites with lots of editors, or for complex sites. Uh, and it's kind of part of the, the enterprise focus that I, that I started out by mentioning. Another, part, another thing that the enterprises are talking a lot about these days is Headless. And today I'll announce that we're, uh, we'll be adding Headless uh, to the core as well. And this, the, the thing I was saying with Hardcore, the second thing, great thing about the open API, 
is that we'll use the same standard for hardcore that we use for that we'll be using in Umbraco. Uh, that means that your project can start out uh, in Umbraco. You can use the headless features, the read-only APIs that comes with the core. Uh, and then, as you uh, start to scale your project, you start, start to uh, have uh, visitors all around the world, and you want that global availability, or you want those super fast responses because the, the thing is served from the cache uh, in Cloudflare, then you can opt into hardcore. So this is the vision of where we want to go with Headless in core, and how that's an enabler of hardcore, and how they kind of work together really well. Uh, and I can't wait for you to, uh, to get that in, the, in your hands. We're looking at uh, Umbraco 12 probably as the timeline for this, uh, which means that about a year from now. Uh, but Bjarke will come a lot more into details on this as well. Then we'll be looking at a new uh, ORM. Uh, people have been talking about a replacement for Impoco for a while. Uh, and we want to start looking into this uh, seriously. A lot of you have, of course, asked for an entity framework or EF Core. And that's, of course, the, the number one thing on, on our list to investigate. Uh, and uh, if you've been trying it out, or if you have things to, uh, to tell us, please go talk to Bjarke uh, or Paul, or the, or the rest of the team, and uh, you know, uh, give them your inputs. Uh, I think a, a new ORM is, uh, will be a super great thing for Embraco. All of this uh, is also concluded on the roadmap that's already available uh, on the website today. We'll be continuing to update that uh, with new features as they come along. Um, and I mean, as I was saying, go meet Bjarke and the team uh, in the CMS corner. And speaking of team, I wanted to also just uh, put up all, all of these uh, great, uh, beautiful people, um, including Callum, uh, and, um, and, and give you a big uh, high five. Uh, we had the first meeting here a couple of weeks ago uh, with this advisory team where we talked about more or less the roadmap that I've been sharing with all of you today. Uh, and got a lot of feedback uh, from this team. So um, as I was saying, uh, this kind of team will be coming for hardcore and cloud as well. So if you want to inform, if you want to get roadmaps a little bit ahead of time and help us shape it, please apply to be part of the team. And we'll be happy to, uh, to make super big teams uh, so, we're, so we can get uh, a lot of input. One thing I've been talking a little bit about or, min or hinting towards is a new bag office. As uh, you may have known, uh, we have three things that we want to tackle with the, with the, with the back, office, back office rewrite. Uh, one is that we want to get rid of AngularJS. The second one is that we want to get, get rid of uh, the technical debt from uh, 10 years of working with, uh, with a, uh, an old front-end framework. Uh, and then the third one is that uh, we want to get rid of that big uh, unofficial API uh, that more or less is AngularJS today. So if, if you... Uh, if You'll probably know that uh, our, API, our official API for the back office is actually quite limited today. Uh, but uh, everybody, including myself, and uh, we've been encouraging it, uh, you know, looks into the AngularJS implementation and tries to uh, pull stuff out of, uh, of places where they were probably not meant to be pulled from. And that means that it's very hard for us to maintain and to clean up the code because we, know, we don't know what part of our implementation people are actually using. So we want to get rid of that so we can have a nice API that does all the things that you need to do and that we don't break, even if we want to do architectural changes to the back office. So we've been uh, introducing this three-part plan to how we want to tackle this. The first one is a standalone uh, UI library. And Diagab and the team uh, has been working on uh, web components that, in that embodies uh, all of the Embraco DNA or the back office DNA that you know today. And this is actually available now. Um, in a version one, um, and we're, we're really happy about this, uh, and we started using it ourselves in the cloud portal. Actually, uh, Christian will talk a little bit more about how that looks in, uh, in real life, uh, but it's super cool to be able to, to dog food it a little bit and try it out. If you want to learn more about that or about how to use web components in Umbraco, uh, go see Julia's talk uh, tomorrow, I think, um, or today. Uh, and um, you can learn a lot from her, I'm sure. Uh, there's also a workshop on Friday that's all about the UI library where you can, uh, where you can learn how to use it if you want to use it uh, in Umbraco as well. And there's, it's more of a workshop style where we work along. 
The second part is that we were defining a, a well-defined API. So we had an RFC out where we asked for your feedback and got some uh, really uh, nice feedback on what the API should be. And we've closed that API now. What the API will be for the new back office is actually determined now. Uh, probably hold your implementations for just a little bit. And, and that brings us to the implementation of the new back office. We put out a new RFC this week that describes how we intend to build the new back office, what tools we'll use, uh, what architecture patterns and, and all that stuff. Uh, and you should, uh, should go and read that and, and help us uh, make the best decisions on this. Back office is, of course, super critical to uh, the user experience and to uh, your development experience of making uh, the editing experience great for your users. So um, along with that, there's actually a prototype uh, available uh, where you can click through, and this is uh, kind of how we intend the back office to be built. Uh, and you can go uh, use that today if you want to play with it, uh, and you can read the code and see how it's built. And, and uh, it's, it's super exciting to see that we have something that actually starts to resemble back office that actually works with our new APIs, with uh, property editors as web components, etc. So uh, for the new back office, we're aiming for Embraco 13, and I want to underline aiming again. This is a, pr a huge project, and it's, uh, there's so many uncertainties that we don't really know about. Uh, so, uh, but the aim is that we want to have it out by 13, uh, and we want to do this uh, the same way that we did 9. So we'll be shipping uh, updates uh, or sh shipping alpha releases and beta releases as soon as we have them, so you can start to play with it, so you can start to build against it, so we'll make sure that packages can be available uh, at launch as well. Go meet uh, Jakob and the team uh, in the CMS corner as well to talk about the new back office. There's a back office community teams uh, uh, around this as well. And there's actually uh, more community teams than ever before in Umbraco. And I think that is uh, a testament to Emma and her team's work. Um, you should go uh, meet the community teams uh, tomorrow. Um, and with that, I think I'll hand it over to you, Emma, to give us a little bit of update on the community. <laughs> okay, so thank you so much, Philip, for taking us through the product. Now I get to do the most important part, which is to talk about the community. So community, very special place in my heart. I grew up in the Umbraco community at the ripe old age of 35. I started growing up in the community. And now we have dedicated developer relations. At Umbraco, we always did developer relations, and we always did it really well. But as we grow and as we scale, we saw a need to create a dedicated team. So your developer advocates at this conference and beyond on the internet and throughout the world, as far as we can be, are myself. And then we also have Warren and Sebastian. Are you here? Can you give us a wave? So we have a Sebastian. And Warren is doing his job greeting people outside. So we, have, we care so much about community and the health of the community that we now have a dedicated team with very grown-up job titles. And the reasoning for that is because the community is our unique selling point. Like, I love to work with Umbraco because it's an incredible product, but the community is what keeps me coming back. Kept me working with Umbraco for many, many years. There aren't many CMSs or any CMSs with a community this big, this engaged, this innovative, this interesting. We have the wonderful blessing of having so many of you here with us today and also with us online. And the brilliant thing about being a part of a tech community is you're contributing. You are contributing to the health of this project, you are contributing to the future of the software, and you're contributing to the community by virtue of being here. There are so many ways to be involved. These days, we ask the community directly, explicitly, for input around the roadmap. You can contribute to RFCs, which stands for Request for Comments or Contributions, depending on which mood you're in on that day. We also ask you to comment on the issue tracker, submit pull requests. You know, when we talk about community contributions, we're not just talking about lines of code, but you also do an awful lot of that. We built Umbraco 9 together. We built Umbraco 9 as a community in league with HQ. Now, if you were present for the V9 launch, which was an online launch, I was physically present, you might remember that we ended by thanking 121 unique contributors to Umbraco 9. 
And they actually managed to submit 1,326 code contributions to that release. So it's a massive joint effort, and it's a huge round of applause to the community for that. And V9, V9 is an incredible release, and it's a fantastic release because we work together. Because even in those beta stages, you had a say. You didn't just, you didn't only contribute lines of code. You contributed your opinion, your time, and it was a fantastic experience for everybody, internally, externally, on the fringes of the community, right in the middle of the community. We all did it together. And we feel the same about V10. And Braco 10 is also a joint venture. We were able to release release, can, to release release candidates thick and fast, thanks to the input from some wonderful community members who were quick to tell us what we needed to do to make your lives easier, because you know Umbraco, you were the practitioners. So a quick shout out goes to Matt Brailsford for being massively involved in the RC process. If we could do a quick round of applause. As a team, we don't work in a vacuum. We need to hear from you to make our project the best that it can be. You know us best. It's amazing to be a part of a project that asks its practitioners, its developers, its implementers, its, its clients, its users into the process. We haven't, always, um, we haven't always had explicit channels that you can join. We were smaller, and it was easier for you to tap somebody on the shoulder. But there are so many ways that you can do that now, officially, unofficially, whether you're online with us or whether you're here in person. And we believe that what makes Umbraco the incredible project it is, is that we do that effectively. We listen to you, and we hear from you. We don't always do what you tell us, but we listen to you. So if you're interested in contributing, in any way, then we'd love for you to join our session on Friday. In our session on Friday, we're going to be picking a few people to make their first, or one person, maybe two, to, pick, to make their first code contribution. But it's not just contributions to the core that we want to celebrate. We have all kinds of contribution here. We've got talk speakers, we've got writers, we've got people that tell people where the toilet is because they've already been to the toilet. Like, we need a friendly, thriving community for everybody to find their way around here not just their way around the code, the code base. We have package developers that create the ecosystem alongside everybody. It's a, truly, it's a truly collaborative experience. So please join us for Umbra Collab on Friday. Learn how to become a contributor. Get excited about contributing again. Continue contributing. It's going to be a session for everybody. So you are invited in. We hope there is no such thing as an inner circle here at Umbraco. We need you to be a part of it. Friendly isn't a tagline, it's an ethos. We believe that we've always been friendly. Now that we're bigger, now that we've scaled, we think it's really important to have process in place to make sure that we're friendly. When you all came, when you all bought your ticket, you said yes to the code of conduct. So that's another one of those ways in league with the community that we created a really safe, inclusive, and fantastically engaging space. We're really happy to have you here. So keep contributing. Now, I hate to be needy, but we'd like for you to invite us to. So we don't want you to be running community initiatives without us hearing about it. It's a very Danish tradition to do really cool things and then not brag about it. I'm learning about Danish culture right now. But we need to hear from you. We need to hear what you're up to. Invite us to your things. Philip is a very mobile man. He will get to your meetups. He will go and uh, meet the people. I do the same. I hope that none of you leave without me saying hello and high five you rock to you. And we are a friendly bunch. We need to be everywhere. And we need to be everywhere because our community grows when it's open. We want to know what you're up to. We want to celebrate that. In addition, after the event, we're going to be asking you what went well. We're going to be asking you what you're excited about. And we're going to be asking you some quite personal questions, like, how do you contribute? What is your interest? What stops you from contributing? So if you hear from us in the next few weeks, it's because we're, like, we're trying to know you better. If we know you better, we can do better for you. We believe that there's a huge amount of untapped potential in this community. When I first came to an Umbraco event, I heard about people, people were talking about contributions and they were talking about community and I didn't really understand what it meant 
or even why it was important. You know, I was here to be a developer and to learn how to be better at my job. We have the outside in and the inside out at Umbraco. We are an open source project. And you will have come across open source projects in your dealings as a developer again and again. But here at Umbraco, we genuinely believe that innovation comes from the hive mind, from all of us working together. If you have a cool idea, if you're doing something interesting, turn it into a package. Tell us about it. Don't pass it on to just a friend or a colleague. Definitely don't write it off as something that nobody else might use. You would be amazed what other people <laughs> will use. We want to hear about it. And it's also a great way to get started. Build that proof of concept. You don't need to uh, ping me on Twitter and say, Emma, I'm building this cool thing. It's like a color slider or, you know, you don't need to do that. Build it. Get people to use it. Help us to see what potential is out there. I'm so excited to be here today. I'm so excited to have the biggest, most engaging, ex I mean, we have a huge number of people here in person and online. And uh, if you don't see me around the conference, then I'm sorry. If you do, expect a high five. We want to hear from you. I'm going to hand you back to Philip. Thanks, Emma. Um, before we end, I want to just uh, take five minutes. I don't know if Machin's uh, drinking game has started yet, uh, but I want to uh, talk about DXP. So uh, many of you have told me you don't know what this is, so what does this mean from Braco? And I wanted to, to take a chance to just explain a little bit more of it. And of course, there'll be multiple talks today and, and throughout the conference where you can learn a lot more. Um, but I wanted to, to, to mention it here in the keynote as well. So probably if you've heard any talk about, the, uh, about a DXP, you've seen the description from Gartner uh, that, that you know, tries to explain what, what this is. And uh, I mean, those words don't make me much uh, smarter than, uh, than before. But uh, what I like to see here is the word integrated. I think integrated is essential to understanding what DXP is. Uh, building an, in an integrated experience uh, is what it's all about. Um, recently, people in the business, uh, including ourselves, started talking about a composable DXP. Uh, and just to, to tell the, the two apart, uh, you can kind of think of a composable DXP where uh, some of the magic also happens outside of your own project, in a, maybe in a software as a service solution that's then integrated into, the, into your project. Um, so I want to say again that integrated or the integrations, that is the key for DXP. And this is not completely new to Umbraco. Umbraco has always been about uh, extensions, about packages, about extending the functionality, about bringing your own stuff. And it's always been about uh, integrations. It's always been about making it easy, uh, having APIs for uh, bringing in your own data uh, or pushing your own data somewhere else. What I think a lot of people uh, misunderstand in the business, or I think what they're doing wrong uh, about DXP, is that they're thinking of DXP as a technology-only thing. And that brings me back to this, the point I was trying to make in the beginning, that I think what Umbraco is and what makes Umbraco special is this relationship between people and technology. It's not a technology-only thing. We need to include people. And I think this is where Umbraco has a super special place to play in that whole DXP space where there's lots of competitors and all that stuff. I think it's the people side. I'm talking about all of you, of course, building uh, nice integrations, building nice packages. But also, I think what a lot of people don't see in a DXP is um, the editor's experience of it. And I think that's super central to building a successful DXP because your editors, I mean, they think it's, it's all right if you have a dam somewhere where your media lives and a PIM somewhere where your products live and you have a, a CMS somewhere where your content to your website lives and then you have a system four, five, and six as well. They think that's all fine. But they don't want to go three places if they need to update a product picture, uh, build a new landing page, uh, and uh, update the price. They, they see, see that as three parts of the same thing. They're, they're updating a, a product, right? Uh, and they want to be able to go one place and do that for all of the systems, and then the rest of it is 
just technology flowing behind. And I think that's where Umbraco has a special uh, place in this DXP space, because a lot of other DXP solutions are just about the integrations. It's just about making sure that the data is available. But I think the, the magic here is the people perspective. We want to make sure that when we build it, nice integrations, we want to be make them great for the editor as well. Not just about bringing in your data, but about making it easy to work with for your editors. You can, see that, you can say that Umbraco is already a composable, composable DXP today, but uh, as I was saying, uh, you know, the integrations is really what makes a composable DXP. It's like, that, that's the secret sauce. If there's no integration, what are you? They're like, the integration is what brings value to this platform. Um, and there's two parts to this. Um, the first one is about actually having the integrations. A lot of that will mean uh, that uh, those of you who are developers, you'll be building them. Uh, sometimes um, we'll have stuff uh, on the shelves. Uh, and our, our strategy around DXP uh, relies on technology partners. Uh, yesterday, we had a, had a partner summit where we met with all of our regular partners, typically from agencies, and we started a new category of partnerships where we now also have technology partners. A lot of them were there yesterday, and we had some great talks uh, and, uh, and, and learned a lot of uh, cool stuff about what they're doing. But technology and partnerships, uh, uh, partnerships is our strategy to growing uh, the DXP offering, to growing the number of integrations. There's also scenarios uh, where we need to build the integrations ourselves because these are just you know, people that are very hard to make a partnership with uh, and that are super critical for you or for your users when they're looking for uh, what does Umbraco work with HubSpot or does Umbraco work with commerce tools or something like that. Uh, so we've, we've, we will, and we've started building already, uh, we've built these six integrations already uh, for, for, uh, for ourselves and we'll continue to build more. You should go see Adrian's talk, he's on the integrations team. Uh, go see his talk and learn about uh, the six specific ones and, and which ones are coming, coming next. The other part of that equation, other than having the integrations, is about discovery. People need to be able to find them. I mean, the number one thing you do if you're looking for a website and your uh, agency tells you we should build this on Umbraco, that means you, you, if you're the CMO, you go home and then you Google Umbraco plus uh, and then whatever else we use. And that might be HubSpot, that might be Salesforce, that might be something. And we need to make sure that all of those are available uh, somewhere to be found so that it looks like, and, and it is like, uh, that there are integrations that are ready for you to use. So we've, we've started talking about this Umbraco marketplace as the, as the place for discovery. Uh, I think we, t we talked about this probably last year uh, for the first time, and it's grown a lot internally with us trying to figure out what is it that this will actually be. So the Umbraco marketplace uh, will eventually uh, replace the catalog for packages that you know uh, from, on our. Uh, it will replace uh, all the listings that we have on .com with packages, and it will kind of unify them into this marketplace where if you're a CMO, you can go in and, and find uh, your partners there, uh, and if you're a developer, you can go in and find all of your packages there. So there'll be one source of truth. Um, and we want to make that super easy for those of you who are developers. Uh, so we'll be automatically uh, reading packages uh, from the Nougat catalog. So all you need to do to be listed is to add the Umbraco-Marketplace tag the next time you do a release of your package. The Marketplace will still, uh, there will still be a little bit of time before that's out. But uh, the next time you do a release, uh, please uh, add this tag so we can start to have real data in our catalog uh, to, to work on. So summing up, I think uh, hopefully you're as excited as I am about uh, the achievements uh, over the last couple of years and the plans for the next. Uh, I think we have a pretty bright future ahead of us. Um, we will be available for the Yes to Speaker sessions. I think we're probably a little over time, so the time might be a little later, uh, but we'll be available for questions uh, after a few more talks. You should uh, come talk to Kim and me and Emma and all of us. Uh, we'll be out there, uh, Kim probably over in the, in the, in the trailer. Uh, I'll be in the corners as well. Uh, Emma will be everywhere. Uh, and uh, on behalf of all of us, uh, I just want to say thank you for coming. Uh, I hope you have a great conference uh, and enjoy.